discussing today. Um, <coughs> so the people who put this together initially were the trio of us, which is David, uh, Jeff Barker, who couldn't be here, and myself. I'm the computer scientist in the group, okay? And as you can see from my hair, I'm an old time computer scientist. So just to introduce myself, I've been for the last 25 years at the University of California in San Diego. So yes, I'm coming from all the way across the US. <laughs> as far as you can go in the US before you hit Mexico. Um, <coughs> and I've been at an institution there called the San Diego Supercomputer Center. I won't go into all of my background, but you know, in the old days I was a database guy, did parallel computing, big systems and so on. Uh, but last 25 years, I have to say in uh, 10, 15 years, maybe even 20 years, uh, a lot of the work I've done is now called data science, right? And a lot of work probably that we all do uh, is called that. Uh, however, about six years ago, uh, talking about doing sabbaticals, I think now I'm on a permanent sabbatical into the government. <laughs> uh, six years ago, I joined the National Science Foundation in the US as senior advisor for data science. Uh, and now I have actually retired from UCSD as of a week ago, and I'm now senior advisor at NSF for a brand new directorate, the first directorate in 32 years that NSF has created, uh, called the Directorate for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. Um, but what I would like to uh, say, uh, uh, talk a little bit about is this. So if you were in this, at this meeting in 2018, which unfortunately actually I couldn't attend because 2018 is when I was finishing my first stint at NSF. Uh, I got folks interested in running a workshop on Open Knowledge Network here, uh, and then I went back to my university, so I actually could, I myself <laughs> couldn't come to the workshop. There was actually a workshop uh, on Open Knowledge Network. In fact, uh, uh, Guha, who's from Google, and uh, uh, my colleague, um, Henry Henry Couts uh, Henry uh, Henry Couts who, who was a division director at NSF uh, th they actually ran the workshop here so this discussion has been on in fact what I'm going to tell you is this notion of open knowledge network is even old, older than that so uh, this conference has seen OKN and, and the reason I wa also want to talk about it I think Emmanuel uh, sort of referred to it a little bit is. I also come to the social issues because of these kind of things that I've observed. Actually, David and I have a long history going back 20 years, but we can talk about that over lunch or so. Um, <coughs> so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this Open Knowledge Network initiative, which is ongoing right now, and we plan to continue it uh, through NSF. Uh, there was a, what we called an innovation sprint that ran for about four months. Uh, which is what Emmanuel referred to, and there's a report that has come out of that. Uh, the report is available. Uh, I don't think I have a URL, but you should be able to go search uh, and find it. Uh, it has all these sections, and I'm gonna move through those very quickly just to give you an idea. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously should be relevant to, to this community. Maybe what I should say right up front is a lot of knowledge graph, knowledge base work, in fact, when I was talking about this with Henry, who is himself an old time AI person. And he was saying, well, knowledge base, isn't that an old topic? I mean, it's been going on, for on and on and on for so many years and what's new? Um, a lot of knowledge base work and knowledge graph work um, has been, I would call it bespoke creation of knowledge graphs, right? I mean, th there is in, in some sense, even now, uh, maybe these two kind of aspects. One is that says, well, we gotta create this very detailed knowledge graph that's going to help me do something very specific in this domain with this set of documents. On the other side, and uh, actually one of the things that Google is doing right now called the data commons, uh, on the other side there's this idea of let's represent everything as triples and, and let's use this as uh, the representation for any kind of uh, computation that we want to do, including reasoning, query processing, question answering, and so on. So you, if you think about OKN, you should think about it as an attempt to build infrastructure. So this is semantic information infrastructure, not a bespoke solution to a specific problem. Of course the infrastructure should solve lots of problems, right? So that's, uh, you know, that's sort of the bottom line of it. The idea started quite a while ago, very quickly. A uh, number of years ago when I first got to NSF, uh, NSF was in a sort of uh, uh, strategizing mode, uh, coming up with sort of all the big ideas for the future. 
harnessing big harnessing the data revolution was one of the big ideas uh, i was involved in uh, actually writing that report and one of the things we uh, said there uh, was that we should we need this kind of infrastructure uh, and so open knowledge network was proposed then you can see it's 2017 there was an interagency workshop um, more recently, uh, again, I won't go into the details of all these programs, but happy to talk to you all. There was a new program NSF started called the Convergence Accelerator. Convergence was this notion of multiple disciplines coming together to solve a problem. Basically, you can think of data science as an example of convergence. Uh, but also, the program required multi-sector collaboration. So academia, industry, government, nonprofits, et cetera. And one of the tracks in that convergence accelerator uh, was the open knowledge network. The reason it was an accelerator is uh, the outcomes were not meant to be research, they were meant to be products of some you know, broadly defined products. And uh, projects were funded at $5 million for two years, okay, which is not typical how NSF funds things. So it's a lot, in a way, it's a lot of money over a short period of time to get something done. And so open knowledge network was part of that. More recently, uh, the AI uh, report that came out of the US government talks about the need for an open knowledge network. Um, <coughs> and uh, let's see, and there's a research project. Oh, oh, last thing I should say is, and then we ran uh, earlier this year this innovation uh, sprint. And I'll say a few things that came out. In fact, so all of this, what I'm talking about, are the ideas that came out of this sprint. I think we had in the first meeting of that uh, of the sprint something like 170 people attending, uh, and then they were they all formed into self-organized groups. You know, we didn't NSF did not say well you should have this group that group etc. They just said okay let's have a group in this topic and that topic. Uh, they met regularly. Uh, we would meet with them once a month, uh, and then we had a final capstone sort of workshop uh, where all the ideas were brought together, and then the report comes out of that. Uh, so why do you need something like an uh, open knowledge network? You want, a that, you want a system that has an open architecture. You want it to be dynamic. Uh, it, you want it to solve real problems. So that's what we sort of call as the verticals. At the same time, the solution approaches should be broad-based. So that's sort of the notion of horizontal, right? So you should have solutions that <coughs> work across multiple uh, application areas and, and not something that's just very specific to each. Um, and of course, it uh, turns out that creating knowledge graphs, as you all know, is, uh, you know, is a useful way of looking at the world. It's one way of linking very disparate information. You can actually think of it as, you know, it's the data modeling of the day, right? So I'm an old, I'm an old database guy, third normal forms and all that. So uh, critical elements of something like this, governance is essential. What data goes in? Who gets to govern the data? What are the updates made? You know, what are the what kinds of analysis you, you should uh, that would that ought to be allowed inside of such a system? What are the ethical issues with all this data? Um, I should say that a uh, big focus when we started the sprint was actually government data. Okay, so U.S. federal government data, but also state, local data coming from other sources. Data that's already public, already belongs to the public, and that should be made available and be used in very, uh, that includes, by the way, scientific data sets as well. But the data that should be used uh, you know, to do very useful things have societal impact. Um, provenance came up right off the bat, as you can imagine. So if you're going to use it for those kinds of purposes, so the system gives you an answer, you want to say, how did you get this answer? You know, where did this come from? Where did the data come from? What was the analysis you did? What was the data transformations you did? Scalability, of course, uh, it should be a solution that works um, for large and small cases across different applications. How do you sustain this? Um, even though we call it open knowledge, it, very quickly you'll get into data that is not open or that has sensitivity uh, that may be protected. So you do need to think about a system that can do both, that can work with data that's truly open, but also gives you access to uh, data that has access uh, control uh, rights on it. And data validation, that is how, how are you va validating this data you know, before you put it in here and claim that it's the data about such and such. You wanna have a use case agnostic architecture uh, and then uh, in the discussions it was very clear that things like governance and ethics are big complex issues, they're not a single solution, there are many ways to think about it and so on. 
Uh, what are the benefits of this? You know, you reduce duplication. Like I said, the bespoke projects are all over the place and they repeat a lot of the same stuff again and again. In fact, if you look at a lot of data even, same data is absorbed by so many different projects and reworked on, especially including GIS and that's that kind of information. Uh, why are we doing that, right? Just, just do it once and see if you can maintain it. Uh, obviously, uh, these, as you all know, graph-oriented data and knowledge uh, bases in general uh, are actually essential now for machine learning and AI tools to give you the sort of the next level of power power in those kind of applications. Um, allows you to answer dynamic questions about interrelated uh, data, um, <coughs> and then reduces the entry hurdle. Right, so you don't have to, so some small agency, let's say, talking in the government context, sitting there with a small data set wants to create a knowledge graph, they don't have to start things from scratch. There's already an infrastructure they can go to and they can get a quick start. Um, a lot of activities, I won't go in, into these, uh, but you know, basically it's about inventorying the data, what data are immediately available, or what tools are available versus what, what requires a little bit more research, uh, compiling the inventory, there are lots of ontologies, lots of, uh, uh, databases out there, you know, first you have to compile what's, what exists. Um, <coughs> let's say fostering interconnections, developing interfaces. Uh, actually, maybe these are, the, uh, I should mention, involving domain uh, subject experts. So that's where, again, the social issue comes. You can't build a knowledge base without the knowledge experts. Well, the experts almost by definition are not computer scientists, right? But at the same time, you can't really build this without a knowledge representation expert. So by definition, as you all have actually sort of indicated, by the way, I'm also happy to see so many PhD students and people looking for postdocs in this area. Uh, it is, uh, by definition, a multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary problem. <coughs> so a bunch of considerations moving forward. Like I say, you want this to be a participatory system. That's also, by the way, very important. You don't want somebody from on high saying, okay, we have created this solution, take it. It never gets taken, <laughs> it, never, it never gets the uptake. So it, it has to have this notion of being participatory. Um, what does that mean? Well, this may be one of the things we're gonna talk about here. Uh, Human-centered design approaches, which uh, David mentioned, and actually the entire convergence accelerators uh, philosophy is human-centered design. It starts with what is the problem you're solving and for whom? And are those people part of the part of this project that you're doing, or you're just claiming, yeah, I'm gonna do this and it's gonna be great, right? That was the old computer science, that's how we did things. He said, relational databases, they're gonna be great. <laughs> they were great, but we never <laughs> really involved the users. Has to be open and transparent. Like I say, you might still have parts of it that are access control, restricted, and so on, but the notion of openness and transparency broadly has to be an ethical, responsible system, especially if you're talking about government data and doing all sorts of analysis with it. You better be careful uh, what's coming out. Uh, sustainability and uh, and a very important thing, which uh, seems odd to say, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, and, and actually I, I think it's still a challenge. I find this to be a challenge. Everybody wants to go off into their own, they'll come to a meeting like this, but then they all want to go off into their corners and do their own thing. The end result needs to be connected, not fragmented. Uh, we are not interested in funding something that, you know, and actually if you think about it as a funder, which now I am, I guess, um, you know, people are very happy to write proposals of all sorts, but once they get the money, they're off and running doing their own thing. And so how do we, uh, in fact, even as we put out solicitations, we're trying to think about how do we put this so that there is really a stick there uh, that makes the whole thing sort of glue together, tricky. Uh, I won't go into the details, but I said uh, the initial set of the set of participants who came to the first meeting that self-organized into interest groups. And we had 17 different interest groups. Emmanuel is in one of them, and I heard financial data somewhere back there, and that's what he was working on. Um, <coughs> so we just took a sort of a broad classification of what these 17 different groups are. So I, I won't go through each of them, but just to show you the classifications, there's a bunch of them that were very interested in the issue of uh, social uh, care and justice issues, uh, like incarceration, people being released from jails, how do you take care of them? And so basically, uh, uh, fairness in the justice system and so on and so forth, homelessness, 
So another set of uh, projects, uh, I guess nowadays you can say everything is climate change, but, <laughs> but there's another set of pro projects that was much more uh, focused on climate change and disasters and sort of multiple compounded uh, disaster situations. Uh, there was one that was looking at uh, health communications and sort of disinformation and those kinds of issues related to health data. Uh, one looking at innovation and research ecosystems. Uh, actually, some of the talks yesterday would be very relevant to this. Uh, in fact, I was talking to Tom Hope after his presentation, um, which is, you know, if I take all the projects that DOD or NSF or whoever has funded, can I get some intelligence out of it in terms of uh, what have we funded, what have we not funded, where are things going, where are the challenges, so th that kind of stuff. Uh, another one, another category was uh, sort of projects uh, or use case groups that were looking at broad issues, supply chain, decision support using knowledge graphs, uh, which actually involves a lot of social issues, by the way, uh, and financial uh, risk analysis. I think that's where Emmanuel is interested. Uh, and then remember I said uh, it's a very delicate, so you want to have this balance of people who you want them to be use focused because that's how you get actually impactful things done but you don't want them to create uh, unique solutions. You want to create sort of broad horizontal approaches to solving problems. So there were a few groups that were looking at the horizontal issues. One is looking at, there is something called the NEEM ontology uh, that's been developed for many years uh, in the US government, which is, I think, proving to be quite useful. Um, consent services, how do you do consent uh, for all these data? Um, the uh, K here sounds, it's an odd sounding name, collaborative knowledge graph for researchers, but really what they were looking at is the architecture. What would be a distributed architecture, Web3, blockchain, or whatever other things that you wanna have uh, for implementing something like this. And the last one, which I actually think is absolutely essential, is learning resources. What are all the education and training materials we should create to address a broad range of uh, communities? Everything from users who are actually gonna use this to their managers who need to understand why are my guys using this or why am I supposed to buy this product because you know, what's it doing for them? Uh, to the builders, uh, you know, training materials so people, computer science students, et cetera, can learn what a knowledge graph is and learn all the technologies related to that, all the way to, we are also talking about high school and maybe even middle school, okay? Because some of these knowledge concepts are so fundamental, talking about what is computing, <laughs> that they need to come much earlier. So rather than learning Java in school, which is what happens now, I think you actually need to learn some of these things first. But anyway, so that's a learning resource. <clears throat> so just like what we are here doing here, what we were also trying to do there was jumpstart a community, uh, drive towards a consensus, um, and that's it, so that gives you a very high level view of something that's been going on. Um, <clears throat> the Convergence Accelerator I mentioned uh, had uh, a track on Open Knowledge Network. We funded 22 projects, each at a million dollars per one year in phase one to get their act together, plan the thing, figure out what they want to do, talk to the users, do the user-centered design thing. Out of that, we picked five projects which are funded each at $5 million for two years to actually go do something, and those are actually projects listed here. UFOKN is about flooding information. Uh, Spoke is actually biomedical information. Nowhere Graph is about geospatial information. Uh, Scales is really interesting. It's about uh, judicial information, all the court records uh, which, which are being made public. Uh, and then there's one that's kind of more looking more at the tools and the infrastructure aspects of it. Uh, actually, one of the participants in that is from the Allen AI Institute, Doug Downey, uh, who actually works with uh, Tom Hope yesterday. So there is a, there's a connection. Um, <clears throat> right, so I, I mentioned we, we did the five projects. Those projects are finishing up, uh, and the hope, uh, I think the plan at NSF is to now put out another solicitation to start actually doing what we are calling the proto-OKN. So to crea create this kind of environment uh, that has this you know, agglomeration of things. And so it's gonna be interesting. Um, that's it. So uh, last thing I want to do, the email that Jeff sent. So I do wanna read what uh, uh, Jeff Bauka said. I, as, as David rightly said, Jeff is a guru. 
and I've learned so much from him. Um, I think he, one, of, one of the lines I've used and I've actually given it out at other meetings and, and people really came and talked to me about it, is all data is political. And when he said that, I said, wow, you know, that's really true. <laughs> so I'll just read uh, the bullets that Jeff gave out as things that we could be keeping in mind for this meeting. First and foremost, uh, again, as David said, this is not just about a one-off meeting. So we're not just meeting here today. I think our goal is, in fact, to see how do, do we carry this forward and what is the this, as David said. What, what, is, what are we carrying forward and what would we want to carry forward? It is the beginning of an engagement. Uh, only if we spend time with each other and, and learn to talk and play together can we succeed. I can never stress this enough. It's all about putting the time in, even if it feels weird at the, for the first, at the first, you know, at the beginning, right? Um, so it may seem like ah, I'm just here for because I'm wasting my time. You know, uh, it's better to be in the dry room than the wet outside. Yeah, it's okay, but you know, at least you're here and get started. <coughs> we, and he's talking about the social folks, are not outside critics. <laughs> Sorry. We want to be in the sandpit with you and help you think through your work. And we have skills to bring to the table in terms of organization theory. Um, actually, I'll read his parenthetical comments too. Jeff is always interesting to read. A longer term argument is that the history of computing is largely the history of organization and bureaucracy, but let's not go there. Okay. Uh, and by the way, you know how startups become bureaucratic in no time. I, I won't name names, but you know, there are some really bureaucratic big trillion dollar companies out there. Uh, organizations process information, sure, but that's never a pure process. And he has a reference for that. The last one I really like, and some of the posters and even talks yesterday, I think in a way get to this, which is knowledge is never about clear ontologies. Uh, <clears throat> which would be nice if it was. It's always about shifting ontologies. In a way, it's by, by definition it is. And actually it was really interesting to see the some of the talks yesterday about temporal aspects. And, and I think there was a presentation about uh, models uh, that were learned on old data and, and suddenly new terms come in and so on. And, and the dynamic thing has been a part of the discussion even in the OKN. But oh boy, I mean, it's so hard to do the static. <laughs> then we get to the dynamic. So I'll stop with that, and what do we want to do? Shall we 